everyone i'm very glad to welcome you all to today's video on the occasion of world pi week which is observed from april 22nd to april 29th every year this video is a very small effort to spread awareness about what is a pi what a person with this condition undergoes and how a better or a early diagnosis can positively impact the quality of life of that person so before we begin with, I would like to introduce myself. I am Mercy Rofina, a PhD student in Dr. Vinod Skaria's lab at CSIR IGIB New Delhi. And PI stands for Primary Immunodeficiency and PIDs or Primary Immunodeficiency Disorders. These are a group of more than 450 disorders of human immune system with varying degrees of severity. So clinically, how a person with a PID or a primary immunodeficiency condition is identified, what are their common clinical manifestations, currently how are cl uh, clinicians diagnosing such people who carry, this, uh, carry these symptoms and how uh, early diagnosis or a better diagnosis is positively impacting the quality of life of a person. So on all these questions, to throw some light on all these questions, today we have with us here Dr. Geeta Govindraj, Professor, School of uh, Family Health Sciences, Kerala University of Health Sciences and Professor of Pediatrics. She has got immense experience in treating patients with primary immunodeficiency conditions for a very long period of time and we are extremely glad that you accepted this and you joined us today for this video, ma'am. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. So, it would be great if you could share with us like what exactly a PID or a primary immunodeficiency condition is and uh, some of the stories you have come across in your career of a person, of a patient, their families, how was their journey all about? Thank you, uh, Dr. Mercy. And uh, uh, it's, it's really uh, a privilege uh, to be on this uh, program with you. Actually, uh, all the work was done at Government Medical College, Code, okay. which is in Kerala. And we had a project funded by the Science and Engineering Research Board in collaboration with CSIR Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, uh, where you are now. Yeah. And uh, that actually uh, laid the foundations for a program, and which is now supported by um, the Foundation for Primary Immune Deficiency Disorders, okay. uh, as well as uh, we had um, support from the DHR, the Multidisciplinary Research Unit in our hospital. And uh, all the whole exome sequencing for our patients was done uh, free of cost through the Guardian Consortium, which is a large network of researchers, scientists, clinicians, and uh, most of our patients belong to uh, financially deprived backgrounds. So this was really helpful for them. So as you said, uh, primary immune deficiency disorders are indeed rare disorders, but uh, our work over the last seven to eight years has made us realize that they're not really all that, year, that rare. And the more closely we look, the more of these conditions we are able to diagnose and with the availability of immunological and genomic tests for diagnosis, the age at diagnosis is coming down and there's a much greater awareness both among clinicians as well as among the lay public regarding these disorders. Okay. So we have really seen a change over the last seven to eight years, but there is a lot of work to be done still, mm -hmm. especially regarding the availability of genetic counselors. That is a problem that we face, as well as the availability uh, of immunological assays. Mm -hmm. And uh, several of them are now done in-house at the MRU at Government Medical College, Koriko as well as um, we are able to do Sanger sequencing for uh, at least uh, three common conditions among these rare disorders. 
So it's been a wonderful journey uh, over these years. And uh, we have learned so much, actually. And it, it's so nice to know that uh, several families have been positively impacted. And uh, in fact, um, this is an, a great opportunity for us to actually bring down the incidence of these disorders. That, that is also a possibility. So like you had stated, like you have learned a lot in your journey of diagnosing these patients. Sure. So Absolutely. It would, so it would be really great if you could share some experiences of uh, diagnosing a person who had this condition. Like how was your diagnosis journey? Like how did you diagnose? How did you move about with the treatment and everything, ma'am? Okay. So uh, I'll just tell you the story of a 14-year-old boy. Okay. okay. So he came to our clinic, which runs on every Monday at mm -hmm. Government Medical College, Code. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually is the only clinic in the state which is dedicated to these primary immune deficiency disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, they are now called inborn errors of immunity. Yeah. Okay. So that is the newer terminology. Mm -hmm. And uh, these children present mainly with uh, recurrent severe infections sometimes they are persistent sometimes they are due to unusual organisms and affect unusual sites as well so uh, infections per se are uh, recurrent and troublesome infections are the main problem that we come across but they're not the only issue these children also have uh, early autoimmunity then uh, they also present with auto-inflammatory disorders and they are also prone to develop malignancies too. Okay. But uh, most of our experience has been with infections. Okay. So now, uh, regarding this 14-year-old boy I was talking about, mm -hmm. he is now a ma the member of his school's winning football team. Okay? Okay. And his mother is very proud to say that he now passes in all subjects, okay. okay? But his childhood was really traumatic. Mm -hmm. So uh, not only for the boy, it was a miserable time for the entire family. Right. And they uh, almost, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the first few years of his life were entirely spent going from one hospital to another. Mm. They had about... Um, 10 to 20, uh, around 20 hospital admissions. Mm -hmm. And among these, five to six admissions were in the pediatric ICU. So he had severe problems. And it started as the, the onset was with itchy, oozing skin lesions mm -hmm. from early infancy that was diagnosed as severe atopic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. And then from two years of age, he started developing recurrent bleeding manifestations. He used to develop bluish blotches over the skin. He used to have nosebleeds, bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract. And his mother used to say that she would be scared to go to sleep, thinking that what she would wake up to find next morning. Oh. So that was a problem. Apart from this uh, atopic dermatitis, and recurrent bleeds. He also had problems with the recurrent infections, mainly recurrent pneumonias. And uh, some of them actually, as I said, required PICU admission. Mm -hmm. So the diagnosis was suspected earlier. He had platelets, which were smaller than normal and dysfunctional, which resulted in these bleeding manifestations. But the diagnosis was confirmed at the age of three and a half years by whole exome sequencing at IGI. Okay. After that, he was started on monthly infusions of immunoglobulin, intravenous immunoglobulin mm -hmm. and antibiotic prophylaxis, mm -hmm. but still had recurrent episodes of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So the family, although they had a very uh, poor socioeconomic uh, background, the family decided that they wanted to go ahead with the hematopoietic 
stem cell transplant. Thank and you. at that time, hematopoietic stem cell transplants were not being done in Kerala for primary immune deficiency disorders. Mm -hmm. So they were referred to Apollo hospitals in Chennai. Okay. And uh, Dr. Revati led the team, mm -hmm. which did a hematopoietic stem cell transplant for this child at the age of seven years. Okay. And after that, things have really turned around and he has not required any further hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. He did not have significant post-transplant complications. And although the family still has financial problems mm -hmm. uh, because of uh, the hematopoietic stem cell transplant and uh, the recurrent hospitalizations, they're still uh, extremely happy that their son is almost a normal child at present. Yeah. The only problem he has is mild short stature. Okay. So that's the only thing. And the learning points from this case, one that I would like to take forward is we should suspect these disorders even if there is no positive family history. So this child had two unaffected siblings, elder siblings, okay. and never had a history of similar illness in the family. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's one thing. And the second thing is, although the family belonged to a very poor socioeconomic background, mm -hmm. the father is a mason. Okay. So it was still possible to go ahead with mm -hmm. a bone marrow transplant. And he was supported not only by contributions from the state government, but also a lot of support from his local uh, religious and social organizations. Things have turned around now mm -hmm. with the, the, the National Rare Disease Project that is uh, on, on, on stream. Mm -hmm. And uh, children who are affected with these rare disorders are getting much more financial support and access to diagnosis and treatment are easier now. Okay. So, so th that was a very interesting story, very inspiring story also. So if we look at that story, so that child has undergone complications right from infancy till seven years exactly. of age. And initially yeah. when he was brought to you, the manifestation yeah. was a, a derma manifestation. He had some uh, dermatological conditions. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. so now I would like to ask you, like uh, in the end, you had also suggested that even if there's no family history, there should also be a suspect even because this, this same uh, person, he had very normal siblings. So yes. what would you tell uh, for, uh, for parents or what is the expected age? Like what will be the, um, the interval of age where you would uh, say say that these symptoms would be arising or what are the symptoms which uh, the parents could be uh, cautious about? Like if you see the symptom, it's better to go see a clinician or would you tell that something more about that, ma'am? Okay. Hmm. So there are um, warning signs that hmm. we talk about. Yeah. Uh, mainly in the form of looking for recurrent infectious complications Mm -hmm. uh, both bacterial as well as fungal. So, for example, if a child has more than one episode of pneumonia in a year okay. or uh, more than one episode of meningitis, mm -hmm. okay, systemic infections like meningitis, or if, if a child has recurrent abscesses of mm -hmm. the skin or soft tissues, or if there is a positive family history. The other problems we have come across are Adverse events following immunization. Okay. So a child going into unusual complications following mm -hmm. vaccinations. That is also a problem that we have seen, although it's not very common. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are uh, some of the things. Okay. Uh, apart from, as I said, a positive family history, which is not common. And although primary immune deficiency disorders can have their onset at any time in a person's life, so either during childhood, adolescence, or adulthood, the majority of them have their onset in childhood. Not necessarily in early infancy, but in childhood. So um, 
the group of clinicians which need to be maximally informed regarding these disorders are definitely pediatricians, mm -hmm. but also uh, various uh, subspecialists as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that was what and I... And as you suggested, it's also a great idea. If awareness is improved mm -hmm. among families as well. Yeah. So, so, uh, so. as I said before, mm -hmm. if the infections keep coming, recurring mm -hmm. one after mm -hmm. the other, mm -hmm. or if they are unusually severe, mm -hmm. requiring hospitalizations mm -hmm. and repeated courses of intravenous antibiotics, mm -hmm. repeated hospital admissions. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are some red flags which need to be picked up. Okay. True, true. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. So um, the, the next thing on the same notes was uh, this person, he was yeah. uh, suggested for a whole exome sequencing from which right. there was some lead into what could be the underlying uh, pathogenic factor or whatever. So uh, my question now would be like, how has the way of diagnosis changed? Like, how is it positively like the NGS techniques? How has it positively impacted the betterment in diagnosis and thereby how is it uh, leading to a better quality of life for a patient? If you could share any stories on that or just your comments on that, that would be great. Yeah. So actually, um, NGS has transformed uh, the way clinicians diagnose these rare disorders. Mm -hmm. So uh, previously, uh, we would do the hematological investigations, the immunological workup, and uh, wait for the possibility of whole exome sequencing to confirm the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, this has all changed. Mm -hmm. So, right from the beginning, when a clinician suspects uh, one of these rare disorders, uh, up front itself, mm -hmm. they would think of getting a whole exome sequencing done. Right. So, uh, this is something. And uh, access has really improved. In the sense that um, there are various schemes, especially Kerala has several schemes where investigations for his rare disorders are taken care of mm -hmm. by funding from the government. Okay. And uh, we are able to access uh, whole exome sequencing through government schemes uh, for these children. Okay. So uh, the wait, um, wait time for this mm -hmm. has definitely been drastically reduced okay. and uh, clinicians are much more comfortable mm -hmm. um, dealing with these reports mm -hmm. and in fact this child uh, had a variant in the uh, VAS gene which okay. causes the Scott Aldrich syndrome and uh, that actually confirmed the diagnosis okay yeah. so although he had clues to the diagnosis mm -hmm. including very small platelets mm -hmm. and uh, absolutely abnormal immunoglobulin profile. Mm -hmm. So the confirmation was by whole exome sequencing. Okay. Okay. So like we had discussed before, there are more than 450 disorders. Which, yeah, exactly. Uh, huh. And uh, you had uh, mentioned that uh, the most common ones are like very few, three, four. So and whatever uh, symptoms... There are several common ones, but okay. in different regions... Of right. the country. Okay, okay. Different okay. primary immune deficiencies are more common. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so ma'am, the story which you had shared with us about the boy who is currently in his uh, school's football team, it was really interesting. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we are now eager to hear if you have more stories like this and kind of different from this story and what will be the takeaway from those. It will be really great for us to listen. Yeah. The second story mm -hmm. is about a 13-year-old boy. Uh, he came to us from the northernmost district of Kerala, that is Kasargod. Okay. And uh, he was referred to us from one of the hospitals in Mangalore mm -hmm. when he was seven years of age. Okay. And his father is a painter in Kasargod. His mother is a housewife. Mm -hmm. He had had two hospitalizations for pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, one episode of an abscess over the shins for which incision and drainage was required. 
and he also had recurrent episodes of fever mm-hmm. for which anti tuberculous therapy had been given for 6 months okay, okay? so uh, he was the first child born to non consanguineously married parents okay and he is now totally asymptomatic mm-hmm. okay and uh, so what happened was when he came to us we initially evaluated his immunoglobulin profile okay. and found that he had a gamma globulinemia so he virtually had no immunoglobulins the igg iga and igm were all very low right and we did a flow cytometric analysis of his lymphocyte subsets mm-hmm. and found that his b lymphocyte subsets were absolutely lacking so there was a total absence of b lymphocytes right so it was clear that he was most likely suffering from x linked a gamma globulinemia mm. so we have recurrent infections a male child and respiratory and skin infection so this was the typical presentation mm-hmm. but we were able through our project to access whole exome sequencing again from igib and the diagnosis was confirmed mm-hmm. so uh, when we took the family history so he had one unaffected younger sibling okay, okay? Uh, there were no immediate family members who were affected but then we kept asking is there anybody else mm-hmm. who has recurrent hospitalizations so uh, his father said there is somebody else but that's different okay so we we just probed a little further mm-hmm. and we found that he had his grand aunt's grandson okay, okay? okay. he was 17 years old okay. and he had recurrent hospitalizations for various infections and was still doing poorly mm-hmm. and was being seen by a chest physician okay so we were able to contact this chest physician mm-hmm. and tell him that well your patient's relative mm-hmm. has been diagnosed with x linked a gamma globulinemia Mm-hmm. so could you please send this boy to us he could be suffering from the same disorder right and uh, we were able to confirm the diagnosis of x linked a gamma globulinemia in this male relative okay but uh, what happened was that he had already um he was already in his adolescence okay. middle adolescence mm-hmm. and he had developed respiratory complications in the form of a chronic suppurative lung disease known as bronchiectasis so that is an irreversible lung disease mm-hmm. where they get recurrent exacerbations of pulmonary infections mm-hmm. and he also had a severe uh, curvature of the spine as a result of these repeated infections uh, pulmonary infections we call it kyphoscoliosis so mm-hmm. uh, although we started monthly immunoglobulin profile axis for both these boys the, the first child mm-hmm. the the, seven, the boy who came to us when he was 7 mm-hmm. is asymptomatic now okay. and absolutely fine okay. however his uh, relative the male relative who came to us during adolescence mm-hmm. still has problems with recurrent hemoptysis that is recurrent uh, spitting out of blood coughing out of blood so that and he is still oxygen dependent so the problem is when you make a diagnosis and the disease has already resulted in lifelong chronic complications mm. so that is something that cannot be reversed right. once you make a late diagnosis mm. so that is the sad part but uh, again mm-hmm. um, during the covid lockdowns mm-hmm. they were unable to come to our hospital which is about 280 kilometers from the okay. place they stay mm-hmm. so during the lockdowns uh, what we were able to do was to route these expensive medicines through the police force so the police in kerala were actively involved in transporting medicines mm-hmm. arranging blood transfusions mm-hmm. they did a lot of work uh, in um care of children with chronic illnesses mm-hmm. and uh, we were able to convince the pediatricians mm-hmm. in the local hospitals that it is safe 
to give intravenous immunoglobulin mm -hmm. and uh, th uh, they were actually able to get IVIG at their homes. So okay. police force dis distributed the medicines right to these children's homes and they were able to get it infused at the local hospital. So that's one positive change that has actually happened mm -hmm. after the pandemic. Um, okay. These children no longer require to come all the way to Calicut Medical College and are able to access monthly IVIG closer home. Okay. okay. And okay. another thing that happened following this, mm -hmm. so you we already had two male children in the family, mm -hmm. in the extended family who were mm -hmm. affected with X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. Okay. And whole exome sequencing actually showed that there was a variant mm -hmm. in the BTK gene confirming the diagnosis. Okay. So what we were able to do was screen the mm. other family members. Right. So uh, because of the stigma associated mm. with the f uh, finding female carriers, mm -hmm. we actually screened all the available family members, including the male members. Mm -hmm. So, and we were able to uh, detect mm. seven to eight female carriers, asymptomatic female carriers. So they now have the opportunity to access prenatal diagnosis. So right. uh, we're able to do a genetic counseling with the help of our pediatric genetic clinic, mm -hmm. Dr. Mohan Nair and Dr. Girish Alptas. Mm -hmm. And actually during the pandemic, uh, they did genetic counseling online. Okay. So uh, all that, uh, there were positive outcomes from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Although I would say that it, that is optimal, yeah. but that was what was possible at that time. Mm -hmm. So whole exome sequencing has really opened up the possibility mm -hmm. of finding asymptomatic carriers mm -hmm. and also uh, enabling access to prenatal diagnosis, which would right. never have been possible if uh, this was not done. Yeah. Right. Right. So there are two uh, important points here. One is uh, one of the patients, he was diagnosed earlier. So he's yeah. currently having a very better quality of life compared to exactly. his relative who was diagnosed True. at a very later stage in his adolescent right. stage. So this exactly. uh, this clearly conveys the fact that the better and the earlier diagnosis is positively impacting the quality of life of the yes. patient. And exactly. uh, one more thing in both the stories which you had shared with us, both yeah. the patients are from a very uh, not so well-to-do financial background. Exactly. And it, it was never a hindrance for them to get access to the treatment or to improve their quality of life. So they always had the means True. to opt for the treatment, the proper treatment and to uh, get a very better quality of life, which is again a very positive sign. And it's, it's actually a very good news for all the people who are listening to this video. Yeah, the government of Kerala is, yeah. a, the Kerala is one of the states in the country where uh, children who require IVIG lifelong, mm -hmm. um, they are able to access it free of cost through government schemes. Right. Yeah. So, so this on the same note, so this uh, comes to the point that we should make this possible in all the states, or there should be some policies coming up for uh, treating these PIDs, like better policies coming up in all the states, so that. Right. Uh, so that uh, like as like you had pointed out uh, the incidence has come low because you also perform screening and you and there's also a facility for genetic counseling when they go for the prenatal uh, testing and all uh, that would take years actually yeah. for, for us to actually reduce the incidence mm. um, that is possible yes so this is kind of an effort towards it right exactly yeah so now as we reach the end of this session, ma'am, uh, I would like you to share your opinions or what is your uh, take-home message for all people who are viewing this video for this uh, World PI Week? Okay. Uh, so it's wonderful that we are actually celebrating World yeah. PI Week. And this is a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for uh, taking the time to have this program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's it's a great idea, and uh, the messages that I would like to share, uh, one is, early diagnosis is indeed critical, mm -hmm. as we have seen in the second case, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. um, which I shared, the second story. Right. And it is important to confirm the diagnosis by genetic testing. It opens up the possibilities of uh, several possibilities, mm-hmm. um, both for getting optimal treatment for the patient mm-hmm. and also for the family to access screening of asymptomatic members and access prenatal diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And of course, the community at large. Right. So uh, there is this opportunity, as I said, mm-hmm. to actually reduce the diagnosis and the spending on health actually can be reduced mm-hmm. by uh, early diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So access to hematopoietic stem cell transplants, access to IVIG, all this really uh, turns around Mm -hmm. and um, things for the affected children and uh, dramatically improves their quality of life. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a need to enhance awareness. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, we have only started on our journey. So there's a lot more work to be done. And uh, we need to have uh, wider access to next generation sequencing right. and also have a network of genetic counselors and clinicians who can decipher sequencing reports and give uh, necessary advice mm-hmm. to affected families. Okay. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Thanks a lot for joining us today for this session. It was great talking to you and It was actually, you had thrown light on all the questions I had introduced in the starting of this talk. So it was great having you here today. It was a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Masi. Thank you.